let the record reflect. We have reconvened with all members present. Rob Catanello is absence excused. He is out of the country right now. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. No minutes for approval. So, greetings to the public. Welcome on this nice rainy evening. And if this uh, current weather pattern continues, I think our mosquitoes will be the size of cicadas, and that will be very scary. And uh, it is interesting how uh, different neighborhoods in Madison are either cicada free or. Um, Sound like you've got a uh, drill running all the time, such as on Fairwood. So if I look a little tired, it's because of the cicadas keep me, waking me up at the crack of dawn. I want to recognize our employee for the month of June, Police Officer Stephanie Carraro, one of our newest officers, uh, is recognized for a calm, professional, and compassionate demeanor in de-escalating two recent hostile and dangerous situations. It's been a, she's been a great addition to our force. So if you see Stephanie out in the car or at Waverly Place in uh, Main Street, please congratulate her. Also want to uh, congratulate our primary election vic victors, Maureen Byrne and Jeff Gertler, along with Rob Catanello and Pat Rowe, and also recognize the others that uh, entered the fray. It is a, uh, a noble effort to um, go out there and campaign, and it's Diane Driscoll, Eric Range, and Carmen Pico. And thank those that took the time to vote in the primary election. Um, I think our turnout in Madison was just under 11 percent, which I would call well above embarrassing or well below embarrassing level. That uh, that's consistent with the whole state. But if if people across this country realize the importance of voting in primaries, we will be a far better place. And I have a presentation to uh, make. Good evening. We started a new tradition last year, and that was the uh, Mayor's Award recognizing heroic effort on behalf of a resident or a borough as a whole. So tonight we are recognizing someone who has shown heroic effort on a continual basis for all our residents. And I will leave you in suspense for just a few minutes here and not call this person up yet. But in a time of crisis, you need someone who knows how to plan and prepare for an emergency. And when the initial patience, a sense of humor, and the ability to work with any and everyone. Tonight's recipient of this award fills all these requirements. Now this award was not intended to really recognize elected officials, but this person was committed to this position long before he was elected to the council, and I think he'll probably be in this position long after he's sitting at this table. So <laughs> let me get Bob, come on up. Jenna, Donna, and John, come on up. So let me just talk a little bit about his effort. First of all, to recognize every, behind every good volunteer, or every great volunteer, there's a family that is willing to share him with the community. So we thank you for allowing Bob to uh, serve us. But, you know, I, I worked, I've, you've heard me talk about how we worked together during the emergency, but I want to talk about the effort afterwards and working with FEMA, trying to get the reimbursements back to Madison. You can imagine the amount of time, the meetings, the data gathering, the submissions, the deadlines, the red tape that is involved in the process. You know, I greatly appreciate Congress making sure we have the funds but I, it is even more that I appreciate that we have Bob Landrigan to put the borough first in, in getting that, those funds. You know, there, there will be communities out there and individual homeowners that will not get funding because they don't have a Bob Landrigan to, to help them. And through Bob's effort, we have received, you know, from the Halloween storm, $410,000. 
And with his continued effort, he's, he'll be reporting this today, but we expect hopefully about $750,000 to offset the expenses the borough put out. So it is my honor to present Bob Landrigan with the Mayor's Award recognizing heroic effort. And reports from committees. Health, Ms. Vitale. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And gotcha, Bob. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. Um, I want to report on the Madison High School Day of Service. Um, on May 31st, um, these wonderful students from <clears throat> Madison High School came together and, and had a, a day of service, and it was quite quite a thing uh, to watch, you know, kids getting on the buses and kids walking from one, um, one project to another. And one of the things that uh, about eight of, of um, the uh, kids did was they came down to the Board of Health and the Health Department and they just painted all of these wonderful balloons and uh, characters versus bring in the children they have something to look at other than the new yellow walls that we have down there but they they were just absolutely great I went down um, you know a couple of times and they they just had a really great time to be together and to work very very hard so um, you know you know thank you to all of them um, and about eight of them went with Marlene Dolan, who is one of our nurses, and they delivered a program to the kids um, and how to wash their hands and how to stay more healthy. So um, congratulations to Madison High, Pat, and you know, to your Board of Ed that initiated something like this because those kids were just absolutely great. Um, also, the animal census is still continuing, so don't forget, if you haven't gotten caught yet, you better get your license for your dog. Um, we did have um, a, a men's cancer screening was held on uh, Monday, June 3rd, so health department has been like really busy. Um, there will be another, on, on June the 8th, this past Saturday, there were about uh, 30 people who took advantage of the adult health screening. Um, we did that from like 8 to 10 in the morning, and the uh, screening included a CMP, uh, blood pressure checks, information on cholesterol and diet and uh, fitness and whatever. So we were very pleased that 30 people came, um, you know, to uh, be involved with that. Um, there was also a food handler's uh, uh, class again today. So uh, the health department is working very hard to make all of the restaurants very safe by having these food handlers cl uh, classes. So there were 24 people in attendance um, and they were at a restaurant in uh, Chatham as a, a little different venue. So um, health department's very busy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Utilities, Ms. Sukamoto. Yeah, thank you. Um, first from the electric department. The department is working on the replacement of secondary conductors at Wayne Boulevard and Anthony Drives as well as pole replacements on Oxford Lane. The department is making good progress on restoring the James Park substation back to its full capacity. The department replaced four overcurrent relays. After detailed troubleshooting and analysis of the ongoing voltage tap changer issue, the department suspects that the problem was caused by a faulty <coughs> auxiliary current transformer. Additional testing has been scheduled to confirm their findings and replacement will be made accordingly. At the last council meeting, we asked residents and businesses to voluntarily reduce their electric consumption for just a few hours on the hottest days of the year to help reduce electric rates and property taxes. The conservation is also good for the environment. 
And tonight, we ask the public to conserve water during the summertime as well. The Water Department asks all Madison residents and businesses to observe both indoor and outdoor voluntary water use restrictions during the months of June, July, and August. Outdoor use for lawn and shrub watering, car, driveway, and sidewalk washings should be restricted to alternate days. Residents and businesses whose addresses are even numbered are to use water outdoor on even numbered days. Those whose addresses are odd numbered are to use water outdoor on odd number days. There should be no outdoor water usage on the 31st of July and August. There should be no outdoor water use during the day between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. on any day. Outdoor water is to be used at night from midnight to 8 a.m. and from 8 p.m. to midnight um, on the specified days. For inf information on voluntary water use restrictions, please call the <coughs> Madison Water Department at 973-966. 7330. Thank you. Thank you. And community affairs, Mr. Landrian. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm still going to get you for that. <laughs> okay. Um, I have some details on this one, so I'm just going to read this. Uh, the biannual fire extinguisher program sponsored by the Madison Chamber of Commerce will be held tomorrow, Tuesday, June 11th, from 12 to 4 p.m. Inspections take place at the corner of Central Avenue and Main Street. The site will be marked with balloons and signage. All, residence, all residences and businesses can take advantage of the program. The extinguisher tagging fee is $15, and there is only a $10 fee for chamber members. Discounted, new, and refurbished fire extinguishers will be available for purchase. Okay, also, uh, the farmer's market now has reserved parking for seniors. Uh, the parking lot at the former Mini Motors building on the corner of Kings and Green Village is now reserved for parking for seniors during the farmer's market. The market also has volunteers available to help seniors carry their purchases to their car. And the borough would like to thank the Mantone family for their generosity in making this reserved parking lot happen. Okay, now, uh, the Rotary Family Festival in support of families down in Union Beach is scheduled for this weekend. It's at the Allergy parking lot. Um, it's a slightly scaled down version of the festival that they used to have, but the proceeds will help to go uh, help some uh, children from Union Beach go to camp this summer. It's a big, there's been a great demand for uh, these camps in Union Beach, and these children deserve and need it. So we encourage everybody to please come. Um, the ribbon cutting for the new senior van will take place this Thursday at 2 p.m. with representatives from Investors Bank. That'll be at the senior building on Walnut Street. Um, the applications for the senior, what they call the, I'll get this right, the senior freeze program. It's a tax relief program, a property tax relief program for seniors. It's been extended to uh, September 16th, 2013. You can pick up your applications, get more information about it at the tax, tax collector's office downstairs. And finally, as the mayor alluded to, I was down in Lindcroft this morning meeting with FEMA. I signed off on the electric portion of our claim for a half a million dollars. Um, I'll be meeting with FEMA again uh, later this week to take care of the DPW and police and fire portions, which should amount to another half a million. We'll get back uh, about three quarters of that, so we're on track to get our three quarters of a million dollars back this year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Public safety, Ms. Bailey. Right. Well, I'm reporting for uh, Mr. Catalanello, um, also Public Works and Engineering, so I'll start with that. Uh, I'd like to thank the Madison Sustainability Advisory Committee, the Madison Environmental Commission, and Chair Betsy Ullman for their hard work and dedication um, to making Madison sustainable, green, and safe. Um, the agenda shows uh, how much work they've put into it. We have a number of things to support, and I hope my fellow council members will, and I am truly grateful to the many volunteers that made this happen, and to Jim Burnett and David Maines and Bob Vogel for the work that has been accomplished. Um, under engineering report, uh, the status of roads. Uh, Sampson 
Avenue sidewalks. Construction was substantially complete on May 16th, and a final invoice has been negotiated with the general contractor. Rosedale Avenue. Top line construction completed the striping and part of the signage required this past week. And a final invoice is due from them at the end of the month. Green Avenue. The Green Avenue bid documents are being produced in-house for review by New Jersey DOT, DOT, who will fund the project in part via the 2013 Municipal Aid Program. We expect to be able to advertise this project before the end of this month. Under sewers, the Candlewood pump station, new check valves have been installed uh, the past, in the past two weeks, Treadwell pump station. CME Associates delivered the plans, specifications, and cost estimates for the upgrades to the pump station, and that happened today, and they will be reviewed by staff and utility personnel for completeness. North Street Pump Station, a new um, commune neuter grinder system? Well, anyway, um, they're working on the North Street Pump Station, has been ordered for the pump station, and will be installed by the supplier by the end of the month. West End Pump Station. Several replacement electric panel boxes have been installed and quotes to place an above ground emergency interconnection are being received. The, the bottom line is we are making sure our pump stations are working for our residents, which is really important. Storm um, drains, Bellow Wood Stabilization. A stream stabilization design and cost estimate has been completed by Omlin Engineering. This really affects anybody who lives on Bellow Woods who've had problems. With respect to the Water Department, Garcia Construction, pre-construction meeting occurs tomorrow and we anticipate the start of work on 2013 water main replacement projects soon thereafter, starting at the Green intersection, proceeding to the Green Village Road replacement, and then beginning on Ridgedale Avenue in July. And contractor Lane Christensen completed Well D air stripper improvements, which means our water is safe to drink. And contractor PCS Automation replaced chlorinators and alarm components at multiple well locations. Clairval replacement equipment has been installed for two wells. Um, SCADA system wireless radio equipment will be installed by PCS Automation on the Midwood tank this month. New booster pumps for well A are being quoted for installation this summer. Quotes are being received for the Madison Tank Internal Inspection for performance this fall. Under electric, the signal flasher at Central and Fairview has been replaced by General Gen Electric last week. Gen Electric has also installed three automatic power transfer switches to allow multiple signals to operator on generator power during a power outage. Facilities. Bailey Ellard Site Remediation Plan. There's a capping plan is required to be filed with New Jersey DEP to deal with historic fill issues at this location. The staff has been involved in the development of planning and construction documents in conjunction with an environmental consultant. Madison Recreation Center Site Remediation Plan. Uh, a remediation plan has been complete, completed by fencing based on sampling rounds completed by PK Environmental and Joseph Norton. Hartley Dodge Memorial Building, J.M. Sorg, environmental consultants, installed wells and completed a round of sampling and testing this past month at the rear of the building, and bids were received June 4th, and a contract is pending. New boiler equipment will be ordered, installed in late July, early August. Asbestos removal contracts is being done right now, and the work is being done, and uh, hopefully that will be completed by the end of June. I think Madison is really working on its projects and making sure all our necessary structures are in good working order. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Busy time. Finance and Borough Clerk, Mr. Wolkowitz. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have an update on several issues I brought up before and a couple of new things. Uh, as far as our audit, which had been in draft form a couple of weeks ago, it is now complete, and it will be up on our borough website beginning tomorrow. It will also be distributed ASAP to all interested parties, including Standard & Poor's, our current auditor, and our bond council in anticipation of that long-talked-about August debt issue. 
So uh, we're on track, we're in good shape. As um, I had also mentioned that from time to time, I'll give you an update on how things are going financially in the borough, have a little window into our utilities. Uh, as of May, electric utility receipts were up uh, approximately 4.5%, and year to date, uh, they're at 2.12%. The water utility has reported a 2.87% increase for May, but they're down 3.7% year to date. Uh, if you take the utilities together, since the electric one is so much larger than water, monetarily we're ahead of last year, which is good news. Uh, third quarter estimated tax bills, the famous yet to be seen tax bills, will indeed have to go out shortly. We have been waiting as I believe uh, you know, I've mentioned it before, for certification and, and also to find out what the county tax rate will be. Uh, I've seen some mention of the county tax rate um, and numbers given. I have no idea where they came from. If indeed you have a line into the county that we don't, please share that information with Robert Califan. Otherwise, what we're going to be sending out is estimated, not real. Uh, the, an adjustment will probably have to be made sometime after that. Uh, SNP has assigned a new representative to our account, which is kind of a mixed bag given th that famous August issuance I keep talking about. Um, Robert Califford is arranging for that person to uh, have a site visit in Madison, and uh, you know we don't see anything uh, terribly upsetting about it. It's a routine matter. It wasn't done for us. It's internal to SNP. The sale of the Green Village property is anticipated to close this calendar year, which is another piece of good news. Uh, the governing uh, body will be meeting with the Board of Ed Committee uh, this Wednesday to finalize the selection of what I guess we should properly call the redeveloper of that site. And uh, finally, uh, the borough clerk will be uh, more busy than she's probably ever wanted to be because of uh, some political decisions made on the state level. This year, rather than having just one election, we get to have three. There'll be a U.S. Senate primary in August. Actually, we get four, because we already had a primary. But we'll have a U.S. Senate primary in August, a U.S. Senate election in October. Then we get to vote for governor, state, county, local offices, and board of ed uh, as of uh, usual time in November. So uh, our sympathies go out to our clerk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A whole uh, new meaning to vote early and often. Yes, indeed, we'll have that opportunity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Communications and petitions. Yes, Mayor. Council received one letter um, dated June 7th from Alfreda Smith of Carteret Court regarding uh, repairs to Green Village Road. All right, now we're first of two invitations for discussion from the public. And this is limited to uh, the uh, agenda discussions and resolutions that are listed on the consent agenda. The um, agenda discussions include the Open Space Trust Fund for Bailey Allard, third quarter, es third quarter estimated taxes, lightning detection po policy presentation, a revision to the peddling and soliciting ordinance, the uh, amendment to uh, alarm systems, and the two 2012 Municipal Audit, and then any resolution. If you wish to comment on any of those, you step to the lectern, such as Mr. Rowe has already done. You state your name, your address, and then before you start speaking, the resolution or agenda item you, are, you want to address. There will be another opportunity to comment on anything. And again, you keep your comments to three minutes or less. Welcome, Pat. Thank That's you, right. Mr. Rowe, 25 Pine Avenue, Madison, New Jersey. Uh, I assume there's going to be a presentation, but I did pick up the uh, open space um, Bailey Ellard uh, package, and I just had two questions. First was, how much money is currently in the open space fund? No, I can is, is that included in our presentation? or um... I didn't see it. I can answer okay. that right, right. now. All right. If you, or if you want to answer while you're doing it. Well, let's incorporate that into just tr track that. We'll um, make sure we add that to the presentation. The, the other question is there's, there's an, a note under the fu funding that says noted closing, seller provided a $100,000 credit, blah, 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 and reducing the appropriation from the Madison Open Space Trust Fund by $100,000. Um, but when you get near the end, it mentions that under next steps, uh, funding request is going to be $250,000 from open space. 100,000 from the general capital that was put aside for closing at remediation. It would seem that 
that $100,000 should also come from the Open Space Trust Fund if that's where that money was being held the last several years. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll address those two things. Thank you very much. My name is Carolyn Pirelli. I live at 24 Ferndale Road in Madison, and I'd like to address the council in regard to our concern to the new access road that's going into the Bailey Ellis Field. So it's your resolution ordinance 26, 2013. Yes. If I'm saying that correctly. I'm yes. not familiar with the logistics up here. Right. Our home, our driveway, is directly across the street with our front door facing Ferndale and our backyard facing Danforth and now the new access road to the field. I have, we have several concerns. Our first concern is the safety of this driveway for several reasons. First of all, come over to my backyard and watch the foot traffic up Danforth on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon as families are out on bikes riding their bikes up Danforth from the one traction like bike path up to Giraldi to Luanica Park. There's actually, the sidewalk is extremely busy on the weekends for both the number of students walking up from Fairleigh Dickinson. For many of you know there's a dorm located at the bottom of Park Avenue in Danforth. We see foot traffic coming up that sidewalk at all times, and especially on weekends when kids are catching buses into New York City or walking up to 124. The amount of families that are now walking up into the fields or riding bikes in from the streets below us. Again, I live on Ferndale, Danforth peaks down and you've got Pine and Rose and all those other streets. <coughs> Excuse me. Many people, now that these fields are visible from the road, are riding their bikes up to the fields. There's a significant pe people, amount of people using the fields now that you can see them for just general fitness activities. You see people out there running on a Saturday because those fields are now visible from the road where they never have been. So our immediate concern is the fact that that access road provides no, no sidewalk for anybody to get in there. Crossing the street at that hour or after 5 o'clock on a weekday after coming out of recreation lacrosse practice can be quite challenging. And you know, we've just added another element to the busy traffic on that street. I mean, I don't have to tell you the significant increase in general of the traffic patterns on Danforth. I mean, BASS, the Jets, and the continued development of Park Avenue. Obviously, it's evident as the county installed a light at the bottom of Danforth. And now you're going to put traffic. I mean, my daughter actually plays recreational lacrosse, and we have practice Monday, Wednesday, and Friday that went from 4 to 5.30. So you're now putting more cars back out onto Danforth at one of the busiest times that that road is served as a feeder road for all of those corporations. We feel strongly that this driveway needs to be one way in only, and a sidewalk needs to be continued into the driveway to address the needs of the foot traffic and the bikes that we see. Again, come over to my house on a Saturday afternoon and sit in the driveway and see the number of families that are on bikes coming from the traction path up to Giraldi Farm. Traffic coming into games and practices is much more sporadic, so we believe as a driveway that traffic coming in won't nearly be as crazy as a mass exodus that occurs after a game of practice ends. Visibility at this driveway, if utilized as an exit, is extremely challenging. Again, I encourage you to go look at the trees that border that driveway, and also the blind spot that's presented as the road peaks at the top of Danforth as coming up before it reaches my driveway. Even now, again, getting across the street, we, we tear across the street. It can be quite dangerous. So again, we really believe that that needs to be one way in. Our second concern is drainage issues, by which will only be aggravated by the new driveway. Some of you have been oh, out to my property and have seen all that we have done to try to alleviate the water that rolls in off of Danforth to the lowest point, which is my backyard. The pitch of Danforth is already an issue, as confirmed by the town engineer. The pitch is, in, is wrong, and all the water rolls off back into my backyard. We are the lowest point of Danforth and already get the water. We have done everything possible to stop the water coming into our yard, and now a funnel has just been created across the street from us. The town has committed to another sewer on this road, and this needs to happen quickly. The pitch of the road also needs to be as a priority as this project goes forward, as our backyard cannot handle any more water. 
My third issue okay, is okay. overall aesthetics of the driveway or the access if, if we're, we're past the three minutes, so if you can just kind of get, get the third concern. I, I, I want you to cover it, but yes. as quickly as possible. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. The third concern is the overall aesthetics of the driveway. Up to two months ago, we rarely saw anyone from the town doing anything to keep the litter and debris from accumulating in this area. Tree branches were all over the place, many rather large limbs hanging after Sandy, garbage caught in the metal wrought iron fence, plastic soda cans. Up to a month ago, we were looking directly at a port john about pulling out of our driveway. We now get to look at a trash can. And uh, you can clearly see where Sunrise's property ends and where Madison starts. There, theirs is neatly manicured and groomed, and ours looks like a mess. The litter in the fence continues to be a problem, as did the area surrounding the driveway itself. The catch basin fence needs to be concealed with plantings, as it's clearly an eyesore from the driveway entrance and from our backyard. This is not like the turf fields that stand alone. These athletic fields are right next to a residential area, and they need to be developed in a way that they are not only an asset for the Madison athletes, but also for the surrounding residents. Again, the direction the driveway needs to be one way in. A sidewalk needs to be included in plans to incorporate foot traffic into the field. Drainage is an issue and aesthetics are an issue. I would like to hope that we can work together and make this truly an asset for all of Madison. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Bobby, we, we address, I think we addressed some of those and others. We will make sure that we, we track, track as we move forward. Yeah, Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard on discussion items or resolution items? Again, try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. <coughs> Samson, Seattle Park Avenue, Madison. Um, I want to touch on Resolution uh, 194. That's the uh, boiler uh, contract? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, this, this goes back a few years. From my experience in construction, you know, if you don't have a good plan and get the right people involved, things come back to haunt you. And if you recall, I think Bobby was on a council, a few other people on a council, that uh, the asbestos should have been taken out when this, this side of the building was taken out. Now we've got to take out the asbestos. You've got people going to work in here. That made no sense, and I said it four years ago. That was the main reason, I, my idea, to start a construction committee to go over things that are going on in the town, because I saw a lot of things that were not done properly from all my experience. Plus, uh, the boiler. Why was not the boiler fixed at that time? Then they just paid some money to, to take out a, a oil thing in the back. Of the, it was very bad planning, and this stuff comes back to one of the courses is more money. And there's no reason that these things should happen. Uh, again, like I said, this construction committee, is, is this an active construction committee, which I... I wanted to start that, and that's what I ran on two, two years ago when I became council. It was my idea. Some other people are taking credit for it, but that was my baby. And uh, so I just wanted on the record that that was me who wanted to start the construction committee. And again, like I said, if you don't plan things right, they come back to haunt you and it costs the taxpayers a lot of money. Also, uh, I understand Green Village Road is being so, uh, going to be sold soon. I believe strong, and I said this three or four years ago, that when they sell Green Village Road School, the money that they make, they should come and fix this, renovate this side of the building, and they should be in this building, not sell the, the property on, Green, on, uh, on Woodland Road, keep that property, but the Board of Ed and the Borough should be together, and this would be a beautiful spot for them to take the other half, and they should pay for it because it's all our money anyway, because a percentage of our taxes go to the borough, and more percent goes to the, the school. So again, like I said, I, I, th I think that would be a great idea for the Board of Ed and the borough to get together, and this should be the place where it's at. And um, as far as uh, 
mistakes. There was a lot of mistakes made in the past. And um, you got to have the right people involved, people that understand construction. That's why it's important to have that construction committee. And again, I like to be on the construction committee because that's my business. I've been in construction. I've been with good contractors and bad contractors. Matter of fact, if you remember, little Bob. You're, you're, she, it was her first time. She gets a pass. This, oh. is your, this is your 50th. And you're the liaison of the people. You know the rules. So, <laughs> Can I have another half a minute? Half a minute. Okay. <laughs> if it wasn't for me and a friend of mine who does pump station, we would have made a mess out of that North Street pump station. It was going to get a half a million, over half a million dollars to do that job. So it's important to get the right people on these construction people. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of quick comments on the um, as asbestos abatement so people understand it. One, uh, as, as you know, Sam, I, I've had ex extensive uh, experience with that with uh, two main buildings, the old Lucy D'Anthony School, now the Kirby Center, and also the main YMCA facility. I am actually still, after many uh, asbestos abatements, still doing more because the, the best space often for the asbestos to be is right where it is if it's undisturbed. When you go into an area, then, and you're cutting pipes and all that, then you obviously have to take care of it. The advantage of this building is the boiler room is accessible from the outside. It can be isolated, so it's a very easy project. So the, the fact that this may not even be costing us more than if we had done it earlier. Um, we, you always like to do things all at once. It doesn't always happen to do that, happen that way. I haven't shared a story to the uh, staff here that when the we did the last project at the Y. We did a, spent probably an extra $30,000 put steel work to get around the boilers, and then we replaced them three years later. And you know, that obviously was money out the window. This is not necessarily the case. So we, we are attacking it in a proper way, and um, you know, it's, it's a good process, and, and we also thank you again for your help on the North Street. And uh, what you just said, I totally disagree with your whole Right. That's totally wrong. Should have been done at the time when we were up there. Right, thank you. you know, Anyone so else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close this part of the agenda and move on to agenda discussions. And number one is the Belly Ellard Remediation and Safety Improvements and Open Space Funding. Bob? Thank you, Mayor. And I wish Ms. Pirelli was here because each one of her concerns we've addressed, I've addressed in the design, but here we go. Let's see if I got this. Okay. Um, well, a lot has been said about it already. And what I've done in this presentation is I'm really going to give you some background on the purchase and acquisition of the property, uh, the process we went through, the conditions as they exist right now, and then what the plans are, if they're approved. Let's see if I get this right. Okay. The Belliola property is located right here on the corner of Dan, it's located right here on Danforth Road. Uh, the fields in question are these right here. These were purchased from the Archdiocese of Brooklyn. It's a 10-acre site. What I've done here is I've given you a brief background onto the actual purchase. In April of 20... Oh, I won't read through the whole... Whoops. I'll get used to this yet. In April of 2009, uh, the borough agreed that they could execute an agreement for purchase, and I actually have a copy of that in here, which shows the term of the purchase. In May of that year, they put a $50,000 deposit down. In July of that year, the borough administrator was authorized to go for open space funding. And then in December, the final appropriations were made, and the deed was actually executed in March of 2010. And before I go any further, I believe a copy of this presentation will be put on the borough's website. So if you want to read all the details, you can, but it will be right there. Okay. The governing body of that time consisted of Mayor Mariana Holden, Council President Jeannie Sukamoto, and the Council Members Astrid Bailey, Robert Conley, Vincent Esposito, John Elias, and Carmela Vitali. What's interesting about this picture, and you'll see this come up later on, is these are the short fences that divide up the field right now, and we'll talk about those a bit later. And in the back you can see the orange snow fence that divides the playing area from the affected area. We'll see that as well. And this presentation was made in October of 2009. Okay, I talked about the terms of the purchase. This is the actual agreement, and there are two salient points in this which people need to understand. The first is, at the closing, it says right here 
that the property would be taken as is. However, remediation or affected area was identified at that time, and $100,000 was put aside at that time to accommodate the remediation. Secondly, the, it states that the property has to be used only for active, passive, recreation or conservation, which means we cannot put homes on it, we can't develop it. It's for that sole purpose alone. Okay, this is the funding. $50,000 from the Open Space Trust Fund, a grant from the Morris County Open Space Preservation Fund for $1.75 million, the Madison Open Space Trust Fund for $960,000. Now, at closing, the seller provided a credit of $100,000, I mentioned that before, uh, thereby reducing the acquisition cost by $100,000 and re reducing the appropriation for the Madison Open Tr Space Trust Fund by $100,000. And if you add up all those numbers, it comes out to a little more than the uh, 2.75. That extra $10,000 was for legal fees. Just so all the numbers foot. Okay, now, why I'm talking about this project. About a year ago, and you'll see pictures of this later on to go over what, I'm, what I was concerned about. I was sitting there for two days with the ambulance for a junior rugby tournament. There was, at that time, there's only one road in, and that goes by Bailey, uh, by Bailey, the Bailey Island High School and Sunrise Assisted Living. Cars were parked on both sides of the access road, so it was very dangerous as children were running in and out. Somebody could have gotten hit by a car. It was too, the, because of the parking on both sides, I could not physically get my ambulance out of there had I needed to. It would have been too narrow. Uh, the single access road, as I mentioned, is shared by the residents and the fields, and on a good day, those residents are out there taking a walk. That's dangerous. The storm fence, which surrounded it, was one of those removable plastic fences. Well, over the course of the years, people moved those, and during this event, cars were parked on the affected area. Uh, and then it, finally, the fields were divided into quadrants. Now, and the surfaces sounded nice, but as I saw these children running around in a restricted area, some of them came down close to hitting the fence. Okay. Why now? Well, actually, I began talking about this a, a year ago. And I talked to Bob Vogel and some individuals here, and I ran this by the Recreation Committee, and I said, you know, we need to do something with the fields. And we came up with some design options. However, I gave an early presentation to the Rec Committee, but I was asked, you know what, don't go any further with it. Because we want to make sure that the resolution of the funding for the MRC was taken care of, so I held off on it. Now that it's been taken care of, and Councilwoman Bailey will go through the open space funding, it fits into the plan. And finally, and this is very important, the affected area is listed as an open site requiring remediation with the state, which means we can't leave it like that forever. It has to be taken care of. It's better to be ahead of it than have the state come after us and then have us to rush to do something. Okay, so what's been done to date? Okay, well, to start with, I was concerned with the fact that there was only one way in and one way out. Here is that one access road. Here's Sunrise Assisted Living. Here's the one access road. My ambulance was parked right there. The cars parked on both sides prevented me from getting the ambulance in and out. Um, the residents here were trying to walk by. That wouldn't happen. Okay? They, you know, they would walk out there, cars would go by, they would almost get hit. I was very concerned about that. Finally, this is that orange fence that was there. Well, what we've done is we removed that fence and placed, replaced it with a four-foot chain link fence. It's a little more permanent. Just let me back, back up one minute. In this photo, this road has been partially restored. What we did was we created a sidewalk here. It's gravel here, so at least now, in an emergency, cars can get in and out this way. Also, our DPW workers removed these fences that divide up the field into quadrants. So now what you have is one large open space that can be used for multiple sports. Okay, how does this fit in the overall Madison Act Recreation Plan? I put this picture in for, to tell a story. All those green areas represent parks. Each one of those parks are within a residential area, which is all very nice. Within those parks are also the playing fields. Now when there's an event, 
cars, and I'll use Rosedale as the example, park all along Rosedale Avenue. Children needed to get to and from the fields have to run across the street. And that goes for many of the other fields in town as well. And this was done by, I believe, the Morris County uh, Conservancy. Land Conservancy of New Jersey. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, how does this fit over into the overall Madison field plan? Well, first of all, we're not adding any, ex any additional fields for inventory. All we're doing is go seeking to improve an existing uh, facility. By removing the fences, it opens it up for more flexibility and use. We're going to be losing the Green Village Road schools, so having a good, flexible facility will help compensate for that. It will allow for a better rotation of our grass fields, which, despite the addition <coughs> of the turf fields, have continued to, te to deteriorate. Now, I went back to the study that was done in 2006, which was used to help support the addition of the turf fields. And at that time, it said that we have to maintain and rotate our existing grass fields, because they're in pretty bad shape. Well, today and since 2006, the, the same sports are here. However, each grade has added more and more children, and now more and more children are using our fields. And if we're going to lose Green Village Field, the rest of the fields cannot be rested. And finally, if it's a site that provides adequate parking. It's a self-contained facility, much like the MRC. And now here's the plan. Okay, what we want to do is, let me see if I get this right, this is the affected area. The thought is capping by means of asphalt is an acceptable means of remediation. So this would be a 150 spot car parking lot. The road that Mrs. Pirelli referred to, I don't know if you can see it here, but these are arrows pointing one way in. We had met with her a while back and talked about putting, making this one way. The fencing that you see here surrounds the rest of the affected area. Fencing it off is an acceptable means of remediation, and because of the restrictions with open space money, we don't have enough money to fully cap the entire area. So the thought is at least put in acceptable parking, so it eliminates the double parking on this road. This is a safety concern here, a, sec a separate means. This is going to be one way in, and now people can go out this way. And the reason I favor this is, before an event, people typically come in onesies, twosies. You know, they'll come at a slower pace, so they'll come in this way. And also, there's a rise in the road over here, so it's safe for people coming in. And she was concerned about children walking by. Well, you wouldn't have the cars exiting, they'll just be coming in. So it's a safe means of entrance. They'll go out by sunrise. Um, and also, what we thought of, and this is still subject to budget restrictions, is if at some point we do need a restroom, and it would be nice to have one, there'll be a pad there because it is the existing infrastructure to support a permanent restroom. Okay. What I did was I met with the Open Space Committee, and I got their approval. Now, when I met with them, I also noted that the view from Danforth Road wasn't particularly pretty. The, the gate there was all rusted. The landscaping along that road is pretty bad. So I asked, uh, I believe it was a shade tree commission at that time, if they could look at it and look at ways to make it look better, to clean it up, possibly remove some of the brush that isn't particularly nice looking, and plant some trees there to make it a nice entrance. We're also talking about signage that would show that what this facility is, it's one way in, and it would be clearly marked. Okay, next steps. Right now, this hasn't gone out for bid. So that's why you're going to see an estimated range of 250 to 350. Well, we already have $100,000 from the closing. So we're looking at a maximum of $250,000 from the Open Space Trust Fund. Um, now, I'm being a pain in the butt about this because I'm insisting on a phased approach because I'm trying to be sensitive to the other open space projects that need to be addressed, and Councilwoman Bailey will go through them later on. Uh, we have very limited fund. We have some funding this year. After this year, it's going to be very limited. Okay. So in conclusion, this will obviously allow for greater flexibility in field usage at Bailey Allard. It's going to help promote the resting of the remaining grass fields. It will address 
required remediation at that site, and it's going to help alleviate several safety issues at the facility. Okay. Comments or questions? Oscar, you want to? Yeah, do you want yeah, me to do the funding yeah, first? Ahead. Okay. All right. This is as of um, the middle of May 2013. So the current balance in the open space account was $1,351,708. But we need to take from that $1,267,000 um, out, which is the Green Acres money we received, to go towards paying down the debt of the MRC purchase price. So when that is removed, as of May 20, the end of May 2013, we had $84,708. The 2013 tax levy is uh, 0 0.018, and we assume that we will be getting um, $608,766. So if you add the 84708 to that, the total <coughs> available open space funds in 2013 will be, now I'll, I'll say approximately because the numbers aren't set in stone, $693,474. And of that, um, possible 2013 projects that we know of that might be coming before the, the open space committee that will then advise the council is first the, the pro, uh, project you just heard from about Bailey Eller, 250,000. We have <coughs> recommended that that be presented to the council tonight. That's what we're voting on. Uh, for the Madison Recreation Center parking lots and road paving, we've got a number right now of 275,000. Uh, we know that uh, the Parks Committee will be asking for 10,000 towards the repair of the Cole Park Fountain. We had a presentation by the Madison Early Trades and Crafts um, because their building has some issues. That's the historic preservation part of the Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund. Uh, they are asking for $100,000 so that they can go to the county, to the Historic Preservation County Trust Fund and ask for uh, additional funds of $400,000. And um, the Madison Recreation Center, well, actually, that is, uh, they, they want the mapping by the Land Conservancy of New Jersey, but that's, that is being $1,500, and that's being taken care of. So all of that is about um, $680,000, um, which pretty much clears out what we have available to us in the current open space trust fund. Then it becomes a little bit more complicated in 2014 when we start paying off the bonds. Um, there is going to be less money because we're going to be paying off the turf field project as well as the purchase price of the Madison Recreation Center. Okay? Okay. And I think one outstanding question was a clarification on the 100000 whether it was sitting in open space or in general capital. Robert? My understanding is... It is sitting in general capital? Okay. Yeah. That's what my understanding so, is. So that is to okay. confirm that it is in general capital. So uh, so 100 will come from general capital. And the other, just clarify, you might have mentioned it. So we're, the first half of the year of this year, we're pulling at the old tax rate. And oh. second half, we're pulling at the new tax rate. Did we, did we uh, count that or... Well, we had a discussion about that, and um, Ray and Jim were pretty firm that, that this number of six hundred eight thousand seven hundred sixty-six dollars is what it, that's what that's, that's okay. Total will be, yeah. It, yeah that's all right, so that that is a good. All right, yeah. just want to that confirm will be that. The actual. Yeah. Very good, Robert. When notes mature in August, the interest expense on those notes also must come from the Open Space Trust Fund. Well, what, what number is that? Because nobody's told me that, Robert. I will tell you. I will tell you exactly what that amount is. In addition, the 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 uh, premium that we received in the amount of about thirteen thousand dollars from the note sale was placed in the Open Space Trust Fund, and that is a uh, item of rev revenue in the municipal budget. 
uh, so we must use those funds for that revenue as well. So that th that thirteen thousand would would be removed. So thirteen thirteen thousand for the bond premium, and then there's the interest on on the uh, the notes that I'll uh, tell Austria exactly what that amount is. Do you have any idea what that will be? It's, 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 it's not a whole, it's, oh, it's about 3, okay. it, well, it's not a large, it's, let, let me quantify it, but it's not a very we're, extremely large number. Okay, well, we have four, a little four bit digits. less, Robert, to yeah. cover those, but I mean, we need to know these things. Robert, could I ask a, a question, clarification? The, the 608,000 that uh, uh, Councilwoman Bailey referred to comes out of actual proceeds from tax collection. That is correct. On top of that, there'll be fee income generated by field use. And I thought it was that money that was to be earmarked to pay interest expense on these notes. Yeah, that's <clears throat> basically the... I thought that was the... the, the, the yeah, the, the first, um, first use of uh, the user fees that are now collected um, through the MAF is to pay down um, the interest on bond anticipation notes on right. the and MRC. The, and the remainder net of that would go into the open space fund. Correct. So there should be enough. Yeah. 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 So that would. Okay. All right. Uh, other other questions from the council or comments, Jeannie? Yeah. Um, question regarding the estimate of two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. If I hear Ms. Bailey correctly, that the engineer is still working on the plan and the specs for this particular project. I think, Ashi, you said that earlier. Now, how do we come up with a 250? No, um, no, no, I did not say that. Oh, I'm, no, I'm well, sorry. I said it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I've been what. working yep. with Bob Volvo for the past year on this, and I have very detailed line item estimates for what this is going to come down to. The variance in prices specifically related to the cost of the fill, if we have to remove it, versus if we can push it off to the side. Okay. The it will be within that range. What I'm hopeful for is that we can keep it down to 250. And, and this, he was using the standard estimating yep. procedures he uses on every project. Yep. Okay. okay, and the second part of that, so in your agenda recommendation, you talk about both the remediation and also the second part is to improve safety. Mm -hmm. Now, the, three, the 350, I guess, that's the total that you're talking about? That's the about? whole project. Right. Does that, which portion of it is the remediation, how much of that is for improving field safety and exactly um, what are the items that we're doing to improve safety? Oh, absolutely. That's very easy to answer. The fast, like in the presentation, you'll see it there. The bulk of it has already been done as far as safety. The fences are down. That access road is partially completed, so it's just a matter of paving that. The biggest expense there is the placing of the parking lot which is the remediation. In my mind, all of that is safety. Okay, so n nothing specific to improve the grass field? It's no. Not. Oh, no. okay. Yeah. Because those fields are in use right now. That had been discussed. However, again, because of budget constraints, the thought was wait toward the end of the year. If there's enough money left in a budget, because the open space will be depleted, um, see if there's money to recede. If not, then we'll have to try to see if we could uh, refurbish the, field, the grass fields another way. Right now, they're being used. Right. Um, they're not the best fields in the world, but they're adequate at best. Okay, so that's later. That does not, yeah. this estimate does not include the future improvement of the grass field. This is just to do what you were presented yeah. here. Just so you know, the future improvement of the grass, which would mean receding and whatnot, Bob Vogel has told me that'll be about $25,000. Okay. Was this existing grass right now? It's just a matter of reseeding, roughing it up, reseeding, and letting it rest. Mm -hmm. And if we get this project done in the fall, which is what we're hopeful for, then that would give them the whole fall and winter to rest. And then in the spring, the seeds would germinate, and then you would have better grass fields. And in a long term, this would be a, for a natural turf fields, this is an ongoing process, whether it's memorial. Park a soccer field yeah. or a Dodge field or mm -hmm. Balliol, or this is, would be ongoing. Absolutely. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I, you know, I just want to make a comment. Um, I know that Bob has been working a long time on this. Um, I, I've been up there on and off, and we've had uh, lots of discussions 
um, you know, with different people about that road. That road probably is is one of um, the best items out of this whole this whole situation. Um, and as far as the fields are concerned, um, the kids are using them, and yes. they're using them okay. You know, we would like better for them, and I think that that would uh, come, but I think they're very adequate, and I think that this is absolutely a necessity, especially if Green Village Road uh, sale goes through, and we're, we're selling it by the end of this year, and that, um, uh, and we're gonna lose those fields, I think, a lot sooner than we expect. So this needs to be done. And um, I, I think it's a great plan to remediate it by you know, putting the parking over, the, those cars are away from uh, all of those fields. So um, you did a good job on it. I, yeah, I think it's great, thank oh, you. Oh, yep. um, I just wanna have one last comment. When I read the 2006 study, and then I read the other report by the Land Conservatory. Um, what was made clear is, is that grass fields need to rest in order to be safe for the children. Um, it, in a rec meeting, it was brought to my attention that some of the soccer fields they needed to make shorter because the areas around the goals are so beat up that they become a safety hazard right now. Um, a field such as this with the parking uh, and its flexibility could actually be possibly put to better use because now it's all opened up into one large area. Um, and then this way the other fields in town could get the proper attention that they need. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so this is uh, Ordinance 26-2013 that is listed for introduction today. Thank you. Third quarter estimated taxes. Robert, you're back up. Ben, you already... Uh, Set the table on this one nicely. I try. <laughs> the Morris County Board of Taxation uh, will not be able to produce a certified tax rate since they do not have, as of yet, the revenues from the state, state aid. Uh, without that certification, we can't uh, send bills. Uh, however, legally, we can, uh, for the fourth consecutive year now, adopt a resolution authorizing the taxpayer to send out estimated tax bills. There is a, uh, a formula that the chief financial officer prepares, puts together an estimate. Um, by the uh, state guidelines, uh, myself and, and the tax collector signs that form, and I'm asking for your approval. Questions or comments for Robert? Right, so this is uh, Resolution 188-2013, which, is, as you mentioned, is, seems to be business as usual at this point, since yes. we can't, the state can't turn around fast enough. May what? we do the audit now? Sure. We as well. We'll, well, since we have you here, let's sure. jump down to uh, number uh, six, which is a 2012 municipal audit. Uh, I had a question oh. on this one. Sorry. That's um, all right. Just a quick one. Robert, since we had the rebound down this year, how in previous years when you do the estimate, it comes always came very, very close um, to, to the actual. Now, how confident are you that this is going to be close to where we're supposed to be? Well, the, the numbers I'm using for the school are precisely what has been reported and, and uh, certified. So that, that number is 100% accurate. The numbers I'm using for the municipal budget have, has, has been adopted, so that mm -hmm. is completely accurate. The open space uh, number of 1.8 cents per $100 of assessed valuation, that is a known item, so that's mm -hmm. accurate. The estimate from the county is the only number that I'm not always come out uh, no sooner than the second or third or four week of, fourth week of July because that's completely contingent upon the county calculating the final equalized assessed valuations for all 39 municipalities, and that is the manner in which the, the county taxes are distributed. Okay. So, plus you have the full value of the, the new assessed value of 
Madison. So that's, again, the, the, would have been the missing part of the calculation in previous years. Yes. So you are using the new value um, oh, yes. as part of the, the county portion? Well, the, the county just gives me an estimate. They give me a okay. verbal estimate. That, that, oh, so this is from them? That is correct. Got it. Okay. I did, not, I did not make that calculation on my own. I get that through Glenn Rowe's office. Okay, thank you. Okay, audit. The audit. Um, as, as always, the local finance board of the state of New Jersey always requires that the governing body for each municipality must certify by resolution that at a minimum all, all the members have reviewed the sections known as the general comments and rec recommendations from the 2012 municipal audit. And that's what I'm asking you to certify to. Any questions for Robert, Jeannie? Yeah, um, Robert, I'm sure you remember that um, we, we used the same auditor for many, many years. And last year, um, I advocated for using somebody different um, just to look at our <coughs> books with a different um, set of eyes. And um, of course, these are the results from this new auditor that we had no experience with. Correct. So um, can you tell us, um, did we really benefit from having somebody new to do this, and what was your experience? Yes, um, it was a good experience. Uh, I had uh, uh, commented to Mr. Cody and Mr. Burnett that these auditors uh, brought a different perspective. They asked a lot of different questions and, and covered some uh, different information, and it required myself uh, and members of my staff uh, to look at their questions differently. It's not the, uh, what we've seen in, in the last several years. They, they uncovered a couple of different items, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good. Okay, I actually learned a couple, of, a couple of new items that, that I was unaware of. And um, to follow up with all the recommendations that they, um, that they have recommended, we, we, um, we have um, provided, of course, in here, our responses to their recommendations. Yes. Um, the only thing that I don't see is, uh, we said we're gonna do something, but there's no um, deadline attached to each one of these work items. When do you expect us to complete um, all these work items that we have listed in the report? During 2013. Before the end of the year? Yes. Okay. Yeah, except for except the one, the, the very first one on, on the ad adequate segregation of duties. Yes, we see uh, that in the that's past That's going to be continued, years. so that, there will not be corrective action there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, Carmel? Th that, that number one that you talked about, we, we've seen that before. That is correct. Right? It, yeah, well, uh, year after year. So, and that's in almost yeah, we need 100. To, we that's, need to address that. That's department and personnel that. No, needs to actually, we do not need to address that. You, we do not. Why is that? Un unless we get involved in uh, uh, additional uh, personnel. Uh, this segregation of duties is really focusing on uh, the chief accountant doing the bank reconciliations, mm -hmm. and she is the most qualified to do that. Mm -hmm. So we continue with that practice. Jean? That additional that I didn't ask. Um, regarding the item with the municipal joint court. Yes. Um, do you know whether or not the, um, the records in question are all Madison ones, or they involve other towns as well? I actually do not know if it's, uh, there are other towns involved. I, I think they, they are. are. Mm -hmm. They are? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so with all the chiefs, they, they don't submit it until January when they're supposed to submit it by December 31st. As you know, the joint municipal court cost is shared by all fin municip four municipalities. Yes. Now, um, I don't recall the cost of the audit being one of the shared costs. Is that something that we should consider for the future? The item that's in question here are uh, unused mm -hmm. tickets. I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm not specifically about this particular okay. item right. in the recommendation. Okay. Right. My question is that I don't believe that it, it costs us money to do the audit. If we're doing the audit um, as part of um, this cost for Madison, um, part of it is to look at the municipal joint court. 
and that portion of the cost, probably not that much, but still oh, we should factor saying. into the cost of the joint court and ask the other three municipalities to share the cost. I mean, I mean, the current joint court agreement expires December 31st of this year, so we're actually going to be starting the process. That's a good suggestion, Jeannie. We could take it to the other towns because we're going to have to, if we're continuing to stay with a joint court, we're going to have to draft a new agreement. We're also potentially exploring an expansion of the court, so we would be bringing that to the governing body at, at the same time. In regard to the issue in the audit, it does involve all four towns. The problem is uh, police officers are issued a ticket book, and if they are tickets that they have not issued, they have to turn the book in at the end of the year. The problem that the auditor has and that our court administrator has on December 31st, the auditor closes his books. So the officers don't come for a New Year's Eve party on December 31st and turn in their mm -hmm. books. So in January and February, Frank collects, has to chase down probably 40-something officers from four different towns and get back the unissued ticket books, which he does and has cleared it. So by March 1st, everything's cleared to date. He's been signed off by the administrative office of the court. But as the auditor, as of December 31st of 2012, he didn't have all the books back from the officers. So they reported as a finding. I don't really perceive it as a defect sure. in the court. Mm -hmm. and. Well, the, certainly not exposure for the borough or the it's court. It's not exposure court. to the borough or, the, or any of the police departments or any of the towns involved. And in fact, it's cured by no later than March 1st of the following year, just through his diligence of getting the books back from the officers. But it's good that we're finding this out because that's additional for work for Frank. And maybe yes. we don't have to incur that cost in the future. All right. Any other questions or comments on the audit? We have that listed. Thank you, Rob. Lightning detection policy presentation. Get a move again. that support lightning uh, have a range of at least six miles. In some terrains, in some regions, it can be as much as 10 miles. Uh, the, the Joint Insurance Fund here in New Jersey has given us a radius of six miles to be concerned about. Um, lightning kills people. In fact, lightning kills, on average, 73 people annually. Uh, the GIF is the Joint Insurance Fund. That's our insurers. That's our liability insurance. And most of what I'm going to be covering this evening is a response to their recommendations to us. Um, many, if not most, of these injuries and deaths associated with lightning strikes are due to misinformation and unsafe behavior. Uh, people should avoid uh, trees, poles, light structures, or being out in an open field. If you're the tallest thing, that's going to put you in lightning's way, as it were. People who sponsor outdoor events and even have employees who work in the outdoors need to take weather events very seriously. Um, there is a National Lightning Safety Institute, and um, several other organizations, including the Red Cross, Red Cross uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the League and Softball Associations, recommend that municipal, municipalities have and observe a lightning safety plan. Um, I have a link on the bottom of this page. I also have a flyer on the table with all the links from this presentation uh, that detail um, this statement from the National Lightning Safety Institute. At present, we have three ways of determining imminent lightning danger. The first and best, frankly, is um, coaches and interested community members can sign up for direct notification via email or SMS text message and uh, when there is lightning within six miles of 62 Kings Road, public safety, um, 
you'll think uh, they will receive a text or an email notifying them of that danger. Uh, the second issue is, um, I'll talk about this a little bit more. We've purchased a weather bug, uh, weather monitoring system, and one of the things we purchased with that is the ability to access uh, through a uh, smartphone application or through the website um, direct data from our weather monitoring station. So when you see weather reports in this particular thing, this is not uh, from New York City or from um, the county airport. This is from 62 Kings Road. We have active monitoring happening. And you'll see a report in that screen detailing the time uh, for the readings you're seeing. Uh, that application also has uh, information about um, local lightning activity. But of course, it would be incumbent upon the user to look at the application. The first notification method, um, you will be proactively notified. Finally, there's a technique called the flash to bang method. Um, and essentially, this requires that you actually see the lightning happen. With all the trees we have, with the hills we have, you may very well not see lightning striking within three or four miles, let alone within six. Um, with the flash to bang method, when you see the flash, count your five Mississippis, and um, that's about one mile. So about five seconds for sound to travel a mile. This is an um, abbreviation of the Madison Borough policy. The policy in full is on the recreation uh, lightning safety page. Uh, if lightning is within six miles, a 30 second count between the flash of lightning and the bang of thunder, or a report on a spark, which is an, an element of the smartphone application for weather bug, or there's a text notification from the notification system, activity should be suspended and everyone should seek suitable shelter. Uh, the website details what is a suitable shelter, and we are also encouraged by the GIF to identify buildings that are not lightning safe structures. So, um, what, like an open metal building would be a bad idea. During a game, a uh, play should be suspended for 30 minutes, uh, following the last sighting or notification. Um, the way the active alert works, an email will be sent, or a text message will be sent every 30 minutes that lightning is, is within six miles of the location. As you can imagine, if you get a second notification, that's going to halt the game for an hour. And that would be a reasonable time to start discussing what to do about the continuing the game at all. During a game situation, the activity will resume once the coaches and officials have conferred and the above criteria have been met. And that criteria very specifically is no lightning activity for more than at least 30 minutes. This is a computer application. Uh, displaying the results of uh, Madison's um, weather conditions. This is directly available from the front page of our website, Access Madison Weather Station. We'll take you to this application. This is a picture of Council Madison. <laughs> Quite a day. <laughs> Show him off his new smartphone. Yeah. And, his um, <laughs> and displaying the smartphone application. Uh, there have been a number of recent um, there have been a number of recent uh, improvements to both the iPhone and the smartphone app, the uh, Android application, and they're now pretty much on the same playing field. There's a sub application that it called Sparks, uh, and Sparks will show you lightning in the vicinity. This is the actual web address of our um, weather station. Um, you can just put this link in. And again, I repeat the, this brochure will always uh, print it out for you. Um, and look at current Madison weather. Uh, this real-time information is very helpful for making the determination during a storm because you can see the wind speed, you can see the wind direction, you can see current weather maps, and really have a very good idea of where this thunder you're hearing is trending. It's coming towards you, it's moving away from you, is it a deal? Now, this will only deliver alerts from the National Weather Service. Um, the most important part of what we're accessing is this other uh, nationwide database, uh, WeatherBug Streamer RT real-time application. And the WeatherBug 
Sorry about that. Um, this is the actual software that sends out the alerts. These alerts, of course, dovetail with borough policy and really is a nice, stable platform to get good, reliable notification. Um, we also have a web uh, form that people can complete and we'll add them to our direct notification. That's the address of the form. All of these links are on the page and they're on the sheet of paper over there. Um, again, the, light, the uh, recreation page will have the detail about this policy and um, all this. And that's basically it. Okay, questions or comments for Jim? Very impressive. Okay. Thank you. Jim, thank you for all your work on this, your uh, research, and you know, it's not only may save a life, but uh, the fact that uh, you've also saved the borough some money in the implementation of this. Well, yeah, it's always fun. Yes, and on, on top of all you're doing with that, I, I just, I'll take this opportunity, I went to Fishawak uh, Festival on uh, Saturday, and Mayor Harris and uh, Bob Falzerano, their administrator, I think they barely had hello mayor out of their mouth and they, before they started saying thank you so much for the sh um, shared service with IT. Uh, it's a Jim and AJ have been doing a tremendous job in getting them up to speed. So thank you for all you do on behalf of the borough. And also want to uh, recognize someone who's also been very passionate with uh, getting this implemented in the, in the back there is Sharad Gupta, thank you. He re represents the uh, Little League Board and certainly, you know, we want to keep our kids active, but we want to keep them safe. So thank you for all your work on that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Let's move to uh, item four, chap amend chapter 139 of the Borough Code, code entitled Peddling and Soliciting. Speaking of peddlers and solicitors. Yes. <laughs> this is a uh, request by the uh, police chief, who uh, unfortunately can't be with us tonight, to enhance the requirements for peddling and soliciting. And the ordinance provides this would only apply to people who are itinerant, who go door to door carrying their merchandise. This would not apply to any of the merchants that you normally see in town, such as the hot dog truck in front of uh, the Martinizer or the gentleman who sells hot dogs by the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank or Esposito's Farmer's Market. This would be people who go door to door, carry their wares and transport their wares with them. And he feels it's a heightened level of scrutiny that he would like to put them through. This amendment would require those individuals to um, pr pay for and secure, uh, be fingerprinted and basically a criminal background check. That would be an obligation of the application. Additionally, this ordinance would not apply if you approve the amendment. It would not apply to any political solicitation, canvassing for charitable or religious purposes, the Girl Scouts, political campaigning, none of that would fall under this. This is specific to people trying to sell something going door to door, and, we, and the police department wants to have a better handle on who's in our community going onto private property at all hours of the day or night and knocking on people's doors and going onto private property. That's the purpose of it. Questions or comments? Yeah. Carmel? I you know, I, I was thinking about this after our, our conversation uh, about this in the executive. Um, I, I think one of the things that's probably like really necessary is that people are not aware that a license is required for soliciting and going door to door. And I, I think we need to have like um, a, a little more education, you know, by the police department or whatever you know, saying, hey, listen, you know, these solicitors are supposed to have a badge or whatever. If they don't, you know, I, I think that's how we can cut down a lot of um, a lot of things that are, are being done illegally. Um, so I, I'd like to see that, so you know, we, as we, we part of put, it. Yeah. Put something on the on Rosenet as to a uh, yeah. what you should know about peddling, you know, and alert people things to look for. That might be helpful. We could probably sign on a Nixel with a uh, link. And yeah, I uh, have a question for council. I, I would just like to confirm that this is written with this exemption or this this uh, um, basically carve out for a particular type of door-to-door -door person, and it would be restricted only to that person. 
No, I have it. I've read it. That, 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 it, it, that, it defines peddler and solicitor yeah. in the top. So the, the, what, the way it defines peddler is it's any person who goes from place to place by traveling on the streets and roads or from house to house carrying, conveying, or transporting goods, wares, or merchandise for the purpose of selling and delivering them to customers. The word peddler shall include the words hawker, huckster, and vendor. And then solicitor, I can read that to you. Any person who goes from place to place by traveling on the streets and roads or from a house to house taking or attempting to take orders for the sale of goods, wares, and merchandise or personal property of any nature whatsoever for future delivery or services to be furnished or performed in the future, including orders for improvements to real property, whether or not such person has, carries, or exposes for sale a sample of the object to be sold and whether or not he is collecting advance payments on such sales. The word solicitor shall include the word canvasser, provided that this definition shall not include whole, whole salesmen calling on retail merchants. Um, do you want me to go on? No. Okay. So I think, I think that, that in, in this, the amendments that they've made here are very narrow, mm -hmm. uh, and they're narrow for, as Ray said, for people that are going to be going door-to-door -door <coughs> selling items right. for a commercial purpose. I just wanted to make sure that the way it was written, it, right. it was explicit enough on that subject. Right, so I think it would exempt the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts. Yeah, that's why I have, I have um, political You know, even, even religious organizations are doing it. 501, uh, 501c3 mm -hmm. organizations that sell different um, candy bars, things like right. that, they would be exempt from this. This is really, Fine. I guess it would be kind of like the... The fuller, the, the, the fuller brush, fuller brush. Fuller brush. Or, or the vacuum, yeah, clean, yeah the vacuum cleaner, dating the, the, the knife sharpener. Yeah. I'm real. I mean, I mean, all kidding aside, I, I can't think of anyone who's shown up since yeah. in the last 15 years who would fall yeah. into this. Can but it? sometimes you never know. Right? The purveyors of um, meats come yeah. to your door, and meats. yeah, meats. They're yeah, that's. I buy that. Meat in the, <laughs> and they're selling the trunk. Yeah. I like meat. <laughs> <laughs> Let the record repeat. You, <laughs> you can't tell. They came. I said, "Do you have a license?" And they said, "No." I said, "Well, you better get out of here. I'm a councilwoman." Yeah. All right. Uh, Jeannie. Yeah. Um, I think um, maybe because I live on the main street, I've seen this. Um, people coming and really try to sell things. Um, I think the problem what we have seen in the past is that you typically have one representative from a vendor who will get a permit, a license, but the rest of the workers, like they will hire, like during the summertime, you'll see more of them because they will hire like college kids to do their work for them. And typically when they come to your door, they don't have that permit because they only got one. They only obtain one permit for that representative. And, but I think what we're, trying to do here is it's not just for that one representative. We want to make sure that this ordinance will cover every single person who are going door to door. Matt, do you feel that this really covered that, um, what we've seen in the past? Or this is just, it's still vague here with the language? No, I think it, I think it covers. I think what, what, the, what the amendment does is it's trying to ensure that you don't have people who are canvassing or selling items uh, who have criminal convictions. And I think what you've seen uh, in North Jersey uh, of recent vintage, if we've read the Bergen Record or even the Star Ledger, I mean, the towns in Bergen County, Wayne, I mean, they, they've been absolutely inundated with, with uh, burglaries and thefts. And so it's one way of having the police double check. And you really, you know what this is? This isn't, this isn't so much, uh, uh, an ordinance to try to stop good business people from doing something. This is an ordinance for, to stop people who should not be, they're using it for the canvassing for another purpose. Right. And if they have a conviction, they won't come, they won't come do their business here. Matt, my question is, in the past, that a vendor will have one person, one representative from a place to obtain a permit. Mm -hmm. So that person certainly will be subjected to all the um, background checks. But the people that they hire for the, to work for that vendor will not get their individual permits. I think the goal here is for everyone who's soliciting door-to-door -to, -door to go through the criminal background checks. 
And I'm not so sure that the language here really cover every single person. It, it may be already in there, and it's you know just a one line here. Each and every solicitor peddler. Yeah. So it's yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the way it's written. Mm -hmm. When I read the the uh, proposed amendment, mm -hmm. I think it applies to everybody. Who's every listening. single person. Everybody. So if okay. if a company is going to have three or four people canvassing in areas, they'll have to undergo this background check. It would be interesting to see if that particular vendor who's applying for the permit um, is asked that question, how many people would be soliciting. Yeah. Well, it would yeah. be very clear so, that yeah, I, yeah. I, I every think everyone... That, um, that, that's through your police department, so... Yeah, right. But I, I think that maybe this ordinance needs to be looked at, you know, in, in, um, in the, entire, the entire ordinance, maybe, and, and kind of go through it a little at a time. So we can do that. Yeah, but yeah. certainly worthwhile going through. And then to your point before is the fact that this has far more value if we educate the public right. on what exactly. they're looking for. So when that encyclopedia uh, we, salesman shows up at the door. In 139.3, what it says is all applicants shall pay the license fee required if applicable. And then it goes on, and they shall give the following information. The name and a description of the applicant, including the date of birth, driver's license number, and social security or tax identification number, um, the permanent address, the name and address of the employer, firm, or person represented together with credentials. So I think the way this is drafted, it, it does apply to everybody who's going to be doing the soliciting. You have to give detailed information with a description. So it would be unlawful for somebody to get a license and have another person act under their license. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So this is listed for introduction. And the chief had another one on here, which is amend chapter 54 of the borough co code entitled alarm. This is just a, uh, a timing. Currently, the alarms uh, run until December 31st of each year, which coincides with the uh, schedule for issuing the commuter parking permits. So the volume in the records bureau is condensed to a very um, small period of time. So the, the goal here is to basically try to spread out their workload so we don't have to pay overtime or increase staffing by making the uh, alarm permits uh, effective through May 31st of each year, and that people would have to apply by June 1st of that year for the following year. So that's what the request is, basically not to change the um, any language changes, but basically just the term of the permit to spread the work out for the Record Bureau. All right. So the current ones will be extended to? Yes, well, I talked to the chief about prorating that we just can't unilaterally you know, People have paid for a certain mm -hmm. period of time. You just can't stop midstream. So he's aware that that will be accommodated. All right. Uh, Jeannie? Yeah, I, I, I think you kind of answered it by that conversation over there. So since this, um, since for those of us who, who uh, for those residents who have the permit, the permit, it's valid to December 31st of this year. Correct. And the, the application will not get if this passes, then the application will not get mailed out in December of this year, but instead it will be mailed out sometime next year. Correct. So their permit will still be valid for the first That's portion the, of the, the month? The conversation is how do we do the transition and cover the gap? Either if this is adopted, what we could do is send out permits for the following year and do it now and basically just get the applications rolling. Because the triggering is, uh, date is June 1st, I mean, even though we're beyond it now or extend the current permits through May 31st of 2014 with a new process to start next year. So. Sounds like the, uh, maybe the suggestion would be to, to send it out now and the uh, permit holders have the option of just extending for six months or 18 months at this point. Okay. Yep. Yep. So they can keep it off the year end. All right. And that is uh, listed for introduction. There are no ordinances for hearing today, so this is now on to the invitation for discussion from the public from round two, when you may comment on anything not restricted to those on the agenda. But again, state your name, your address, and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Under those rules, anyone wishing to uh, comment, please step to the lectern. Uh, Sam Sociolo, Park Avenue, Madison. 
Um, I know they start at the farmer's market Thursday. And uh, I understand it has to be in town because it is a Madison farmer market. But uh, a lot of people are complaining about how it jams up the town, especially on Green Village Road. They can't make that right-hand turn. So is it possible? I mean, you, you got to have it in town. A lot of people would like to go back to the high school in Rosedale. But how about on Lincoln Place? It sort of would release the, the, the aggravation that people got to wait, sometimes wait three lights to change to get through the center of town after work. So Lincoln Place, to me, talking to people, that would be like a compromise. Maybe Lincoln Place, it won't jam up Green Village Road, it won't jam, uh, jam up Waverly. Just a thought. Um, the other day I was walking from the post office towards Waverly, and I want, I want, the, I want the, somebody to go look at it tomorrow, Ray. Um, as I was walking at the bump out that starts on Waverly Place, where the bench is, right in front of Madison Travel, um, there was some scrape marks on those gray pavers that we just put in about a year ago. And uh, what happened was, in my opinion, is when Madison Travel moved, they backed the truck up in there and it scraped and they, they damaged 45 pavers. So I think uh, we should make them aware that we're aware that there was damage done because that's what exactly what happened. Thank you. We'll uh, check into that. And had they had Cambridge pavers with Armatech, they, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to see yeah, that. Well, just to, for, for a point of information, Grinnell is even almost, they don't even make pavers. That was Grinnell, the wrong pavers that you use in town. Yeah, Cambridge, but you got to use the, the Grinnell. <laughs> so go look at those pavers. They're all disintegrating already. Yeah, Sorry. I had also, to... I'm glad you brought it up, Bob. Also, uh, you know, I have middle, it there's, a, there's a house on the corner of Park Avenue and Ridgedale Avenue, right at the light. I don't even know if people are living in there, but... Uh, Somebody, either the Board of Health or somebody got to send them a letter. There's not even grass, it's weeds about a foot high. In the bushes, you can't even see the house. And it's, it's an eyesore. So is that the Board of Health's problem? Or yep. so we'll, we'll, are uh, you familiar with the house I'm talking about? Yep, so we'll I mean, get that message over to them. Thank you. And uh, just a few more things. Are we going to send a letter to New Jersey Transit about maybe power washing them things, or are they going to leave the walls yep. the way they we're, are? We're email, and I have a uh, letter to... Uh, Representative uh, Phelan Heisen for the post office. I'm going to send, and this is going to go out in the mail tomorrow. Very good, Robert. Uh, how about the garbage cans? They're disgusting. Let's get them power washed. It, uh, that is uh, on the list. Yes, thank well, you. You're doing good, Bobby. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else wish to be heard? Brad. Brad Kramer, 73 Main Street, Madison, Jersey. Uh, I'll give you some more of my titles. I've been uh, six years on the DDC now, uh, starting out as uh, co-chairman of the PIC uh, Public Improvement Committee. Um, I uh, was on the, uh, I chaired for uh, two years. Uh, I've also been the uh, treasurer for uh, two years now. Um, and to bring up some um, thoughts about the uh, farmer's market, uh, one of the reasons that the farmer's market was uh, put into effect by the DDC was not only to bring fresh fruit to the Madison residents, but it's also to bring fresh faces to the merchants of Madison. And that's what it's done so far. Bringing it downtown and bringing it away from the schools and from the, public, uh, from the pools has brought fresh faces down into the town and brought merchants to be a little bit more happier on Thursdays to see people walking through town. Um, I know there's concerns about where it's placed downtown. There was uh, concerns about Waverly and the parking spaces that it took up. Uh, the DDC uh, looked at those possibilities of moving it, and we did move it to some place where it doesn't take up any parking spaces at this point. And in fact, the senior citizens now can actually be a little bit closer to the farmer's market uh, because they have their own private parking now. Um, if concerns are um, for the DDC about the um, farmer's market, 
Um, I just want to share the invitation to the DDC meetings, which are every third Thursday um, here in Town Hall, for anybody that has suggestions um, or concerns about where the farmer's market is kept. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting and move to introduction of ordinances. Ordinances scheduled for first reading have a hearing date set for June the 25th, 2013. All will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the uh, public requesting copies. It's the 24th. It is the 24th, Sorry yes. Sorry about that. Yep. That'll be June 24th. Okay. All right, call up, call up Ordinance 23, 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 139 of the Borough Code entitled Peddling and Soliciting. Mayor, I move Ordinance 23-2013. I second the motion. Any further council discussion on this? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Okay, call up Ordinance 24, 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 54 of the Borough Code entitled Alarm Systems. Mayor, I move Ordinance 24-2013. Second the motion. Any further council discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolfowitz? Yes. Okay, call up Ordinance 25, 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Section 75-141 of the Borough Code to correct the plumbing subcode fees. Mayor, I move Ordinance 25-2013. I second the motion. Discussion. Roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Ordinance 26, 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $250,000 from the Open Space Trust Fund for remediation and safety improvements to Bailey Ellard Fields. Mayor, I move Ordinance 26 2013. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. I call up Ordinance 27, 2013. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 34 of the Code of the Borough of Madison, establishing the police department, establishing promotion procedures for the rank of police chief, lieutenant, sergeant, and establishing a procedure for acting appointments and hiring police officers. Mayor, I move Ordinance 27 2013. I second. Council discussion? Seeing none, roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Consent agenda resolutions. Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move uh, consent uh, resolutions are 188-2013 to resolution 210-2013. Uh, uh, I second that now. 195 was amended? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 195 amendment. 195 was amended to reflect 18 months. 18 right. months, yep. 18 so month lease yeah. expiring December 31st. 2014. Okay. Further discussion? <laughs> yes? Yeah. Um, question regarding 202. 208 and 209. Um, In the case that when, when something is questionable um, regarding purchasing or whatever it is, or contracts, um, I want to make sure that the uh, administration has the authority to make the final decisions regarding these uh, questionable matters. Is that so um, in all these three resolutions? Because it really does not specify that. 
I think the language is fairly passive. It's a more of a recommendation language in I think all of them, but. Uh, no, I can okay, answer yeah, that, Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. These are all best practices guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, all the policies include wherever practicable, and that definition ultimately will rely on the department head that's doing it with guidance and suggestion and support from Sustainable Madison and, and various organizations that are going to be helping with that. But there's, there's no mandate built in here, and ultimately it will be um, the borough that will be, and ultimately the council will be making the determination on um, any, any issues of question. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, there's one that's... There was uh, one that I had to abstain. Let me find it. 192. 192. 192. 192. Abstain and yes to the rest. And that was a, to a conflict. There is no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Okay. <clears throat> public safety, $10,833.24. Health and public assistance, $1,804.08. Public works and engineering, $176,896.20. Uh, community affairs, $410. Finance and borough clerk, $3,222,000. $98.95. Utilities, $27,510.71. The total is $3,439,553.18. Mayor, I move approval of the vouchers. Second that. Discussion? Roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Under new business, I wish to make the following appointments, requesting council confirmation to the Mas Madison Housing Authority, lowest spot, 117 Green Avenue. This is to a full five-year term through August 10, 2018. And to the Madison Recreation Master Plan Development Committee, Maureen Byrne, regular member as a Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee representative. Mayor, I move uh, approval of the, of the following appointments, Madison Housing Authority, lowest spot, Madison Recreation Center Master Plan Development Committee, Maureen Byrne. Second that. Discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Maureen currently is not listed in our directory as a member of the Sustainable Advisory Committee. That's correct. That's your own. Okay, okay, thank you. Maureen's taken an ad hoc role, thankfully, in helping Sustainable Madison um, pursue all the certification process that we're working through over the next four months. So similar to Mara Johnson running May Day, not being on the committee, but being an integral okay, part of that. Okay, but she is part of the she's, committee. She's Just want to make sure of that, really that you're not appointing yes. someone as a representative who's we're not a member. Volunteers. Okay. Volunteers. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. Roll call vote. Mrs. Sukamoto? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor, I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Who said a word? Yeah, I can show it.